that's what's kind of cool about this is at the beginning, yeah, it might take a lot of work. Yeah, it may, may it seem laborious to be doing these mobility drills and things like that. But if you if you put the work in, you get to a place where the shoulders are feeling good again, the hips are feeling good. Then there are strength training exercises that you can do to keep you mobile forever. And then, and then you rarely have to do yeah. any of that stuff, which yeah, is amazing. True. Hey, real quick, here's the giveaway. I'm going to give away the bundle of programs that's on sale this month to one of you lucky viewers. So one of you guys will get it for free. Here's what they are. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, Maps Anywhere. Three programs for free to one of you lucky viewers. Just do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get all three for free. Now, everybody else, if you bought those three programs at retail, it will cost you $361. But right now, they're on sale for $99.99. That's it. One payment. Lifetime access to all three programs. So if you just want to sign up, head over to mapsapril.com. All right, here comes the show. So this might sound controversial, but lifting weights is the best way to get flexible. Ooh. Functional we're, flexibility. We're gonna make I feel like that the Michael Jordan meme where crying is like yeah. <laughs> insert that right now and all the all the yogis and yeah. all the mobility experts, like they don't want to hear that. Yeah, you know, before we get into That's the, not true. the why, because this is true, we're not just saying, you know, clickbaity stuff. We should talk about why sometimes you see people who do a lot of lifting a lot of weights who do seem to be tight, who yeah. do seem to have poor mobility. Because that's what people observe, and that's where lifting weights or strength training gets the that myth, right? Yeah, the myth cool. sort of persists because of the way that people train. Yeah, right? and and again, to it, we are a product of of the patterns that we present our body, and so if if we're constantly going in shorter ranges of motion, our body's going to adapt in that direction. Well, Thank even you. even before you do that, I think you should get into defining what flexibility is, because I think there uh, there's a a little bit of nuance even with that, right? Yes, because there's there's range of motion, yeah. right? So how far a muscle will allow itself to be extended, and then there's uh, functional flexibility. The muscle gets extended, but you also have control and strength over that that extension. And those are two different things. Just having that flexibility or that extensibility or the the range of motion isn't what you want. In fact, um, you know, babies have incredible range of motion, terrible stability, terrible stability. Yeah. I, you know, in fact, I, I know that they recommend, for example, that you don't pick up young children too often by their hands and stretch them by their arms because they can dislocate a shoulder or a hip joint if you grab them by their legs and swing them around. Right. And that's because they have incredible ranges of motion, but they don't have any strength to support it. So that's not what we're talking about. You don't want that, right? You don't want to be like Gumby where you have no control because that's very unstable and can cause it's not lots of usable. Injuries. No. I remember the first time that I learned this. Uh, I remember training a client that was uh, a gymnast. So I, I trained a gymnast and I trained a um, – uh, like a, a yogi, right? So a yogi or a yoga specialist done it for her whole life. Both female ladies, both of them could like put their legs behind their head and had this incredible flexibility. But then when we would do like a strength exercise with very, very minimal weight too. Like, I mean, I, some of I think one of them was body weight. The other one, I put like the bar on their back and they would just knees would collapse yeah. inward and they have it has like a very like like a baby where they're 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 wobbling all over the yeah. place and i remember freaking out as a trainer just assuming that because they, they looked pretty fit they had this flexibility mm -hmm. so i just kind of assumed that they'd be able to perform this movement and then their and their their body reminded me of what it was like when i was training like younger kids that just do not have the stability and control and that mm -hmm. was really interesting to me to, to see that in a, a a person that did gymnastics for most of their life and then a person that was uh, a yogi expert i really didn't expect that to happen from that type of uh, a client and that's not to say that all yogi experts and gymnasts no. suffer from this. They're, in fact, most gymnasts are not like this. It just happened to be this case for me where they were extremely flexible, but then lacked the strength and stability within that range of motion. Yeah, I, actually, I had a client uh, that it, it was so rare. That's why it stood out. She had hypermobility, totally inactive, never worked out, was never an athlete. She worked in the tech industry. She hired me because she kept suffering from repeated uh, back injuries. Her hips bothered her too. And her chiropractor happened to be a friend of mine. And he says, go see Sal. You need to do some some strengthening. So I saw her and she was so hypermobile. Like she could sit on her heels. She could sit in the splits. She could twist her body all over the place. But she lacked strength. So she would hurt herself often 
because she didn't own that range of motion. So that's not what you want. You don't want to just be flexible. You have to be able to own your range of motion. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about flexibility. Otherwise, what's the point, right, of being able to just... Basically, what we're defining is mobility, yes. which is flexibility with strength. So the combo of the both, being able to have access and be able to get out of yes. those positions uh, as you get into them is just as important. Yes. Now, what controls how much your muscles can extend or how tight they feel is your central nervous system. It's the control center, and it tells the muscles be tight or be really loose. Now, more people suffer from being too tight than from being too loose, but too much tightness is not because people are strong. It's also because they lack stability, and often that comes from weakness. And what the body does is it tightens muscles up to prevent too much movement to protect the joints and to prevent injury. So this is what you see sometimes when you see guys or girls who lift lots of weights, who don't lift properly, who seem to be and are very tight. The problem is they train in a particular way that tells their central nervous system, protect these joints at all costs. So to give a silly example, it'd be like doing a like doing curls, but only ever going halfway down and halfway up and just always train that way. What'll end up happening over time is you'll note this will happen is my arms would naturally want to carry themselves in that slightly bent position because this is where they're strongest. This is where I've trained. Outside of that, it lacks strength. Yeah. And in order to protect my elbow joint, my body would shorten up and let's say, stay in this range of motion. This is where you're strong. Outside of that, you're not very strong. So if I do shoulder presses halfway down, if I do lower body exercises with poor range of motion and I get strong in that short range of motion, my body's going to want to keep me in that range of motion and not allow me to go outside that range of motion now I have tightness. And this is where the myth comes from of being tight from doing uh, strength. I remember I fell for that trap for a long time. I, I used to think that if you were this big, you know, muscle bound guy or dude, you, there's no way that you're also flexible. And I remember the first time, I wish I remember what bodybuilder was. That Might was have like, been Flex Wheeler or was, Tom Platts from this. They were like famous for doing the splits into their routine and stuff like oh, that. It would have been Flex Wheeler. Yeah. And I remember seeing that going like, well, there goes that out the window. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's dudes 10 times more jacked than I'll probably ever be. And can I can't do the splits. So there's, it's obvious not, it's obviously not because he has big muscles that he's flexible like that or not flexible like uh -huh. that. So there's something else that's going on. I never could made that connection that, oh, it's because I'm training this way. I'm getting so good in this range of motion, so strong that anything outside of that now, which would, would be increasing my range mm -hmm. of motion, I'm weak and my body is saying, no, we don't want to go there because you don't ever train there. You're not strong there. We're going to keep you in this limited range where you yes. always tend to train. Yeah. That blew my mind. Yeah, Tom Platts was like that. He was a bodybuilder in the late 70s and 80s, known for having some of the best legs of all time or Deep whatever. squats. Well, I mean, you you see him splits. He would sit on his heels, flatten himself out, going backwards. He would do these just crazy stretching movements and showing his range. And obviously very strong. Tom Platts is the guy that did, I think he squatted 315, I want to say 40 or 50 times, 500 pounds, a ridiculous amount of time. He did this competition with Tom Hatfield, who was this super strong power lifter, squatted 135 for 30 minutes, like incredible strength. Also great flexibility and range of motion. Well, this myth still persists. I'm fighting coaches all the time, baseball coaches, basketball coaches uh, with their athletes. They don't want them working out, uh, you know, going into season or even yeah. like, you know, preseason because they don't want them too muscle bound. They don't want it to affect uh, their performance, their skill. When in fact, it would enhance it if you do it the right way, the the appropriate uh, intensity, the, the full range of motion, and then also still applying skills training simultaneously with that, you're going to create an even better athlete that's going to perform. Well, you can't blame them, though, because they've been proven right so many times. You know, how many times have they had somebody, a young athlete, go train and get all muscular over the offseason, then he comes in and he can't swing a bat anymore, yeah. he can't throw the ball anymore. And so you start to make that correlation of, oh, wow, every time I have a kid that goes and gets buff over the summer and then I get him into my sport again, yeah. it fucks yeah. up his now, sport. Now, the, the irony is... Shorten range of motion, bodybuilder style training. Right. Yeah. Now, and the, the irony of that, uh, that, what's so funny about that is that doesn't happen in professional sports anymore. You name one professional sport that no, doesn't even eat. golf. I mean, yeah, you, they you've seen do. you've seen everything evolve into incorporating weight training because of the benefit and the flexibility that goes with that. Yeah, it reduces injury, right? It's yes. a big one. Yeah, no. The, think of it this way, right? The the central nervous system is this governor, and part of the job of the central nervous system obviously is to get things to do to move in particular ways, muscles to contract, 
others to stay slightly contracted to create stability. Others need to relax. For example, if I curl my arm, the, the CNS is telling my bicep to contract, but simultaneously telling my tricep to relax. Because if my tricep contracted at the same time as my bicep, I wouldn't move. They would have to fight each other. Yeah. So it's this, it's this incredible dance that the central nervous system performs. The other job of the central nervous system is to assess risk. Can this, this person wants to generate lots of force. Do we feel safe generating lots of force? No limit. It's like a lim limit on your car. When you try to go past a certain yeah. speed, all of a sudden the engine turns off, right? Yeah. They've done studies on this and they find that the average untrained person can really call upon something like 60% of their actual strength because the central nervous system doesn't feel stable. Olympic athletes, on the other hand, who like are very, 90. very, yeah, crazy, almost all their strength. Yeah. It's also why you hear the stories of the, you know, the, the mom under, in, under distress saves the baby by lifting the car off the kid or whatever, does some crazy stuff. That's because under extreme stress, the CNS is it overrides. Like, it overrides. All right, injury is fine because we're under, and, and oftentimes people will hurt themselves doing these incredible feats of strength under extreme duress. So that's what the central nervous system does. And that's what you're training, largely what you're training when you're working out or when you're doing mobility or even when you're stretching. Like, here's another example. Let's say I do a, a stretch on my hamstring right now. And let's say I go down and I can't even touch my toes. I get down and I'm like three inches away from my toes. If I just hold that stretch for a minute, I'll probably gain one or two inches of range of motion within that minute. My hamstring didn't, it didn't lengthen. It didn't change. The only thing that changed was my central nervous system. I was holding the stretch and the CNS said, I think we could go a little further. I think we go a little further and allowed me to uh, increase my range of motion. So that's what the CNS does. It controls all those things. Lack of strength will tell your body to tighten up. Another example is uh, very common that people have tight, you know, upper trap muscles or neck muscles. Lots of people feel neck tension and they want to get massaged and it causes headaches. Why is that so common nowadays? Well, one of the more common, uh, you know, muscle recruitment pattern issues or what are called posture issues is forward shoulder, right? We all sit in, uh, at desks now. We all work on computers. Our shoulders come forward. The muscles of the mid back weaken or lengthen. They don't need to be so contracted to hold that position. Our body forms that way. We create dysfunction, and what happens is the CNS creates tightness in these upper trap muscles to help stabilize these unstable shoulders, so it keeps them slightly tight all the time. Like mm -hmm. the way to fix that literally is not to massage the traps; that's temporary. We, as I just say, even if you—that's the thing you got to make sure you yes. explain to people is because someone will be like, "Oh bullshit!" Every time I see a massage therapist or my Cairo, I feel amazing yeah. every afterwards. time. Right? Temporary you got to keep going relief. back. Yes. That, yeah, it's just a band aid. I mean, it, yes. it will give you relief right now, but you still got to put the work in if you want to address. The yes, cause. strengthen the mid back muscles. Now that the CNS doesn't feel the need to cause tightness there to protect your shoulders or your neck or whatever. And by the way, if you're a trainer, this is to me. This is where uh, this is like the the next level of like coaching. When you get this, yes. this is what Prime Pro is all about. This is why we did Prime. Like this is for like when you're a coach. This is what I love about this. It could it could take you months. Uh, sometimes even longer to get a client to add 10 pounds of muscle on their body. Yeah, or right? lose 30 pounds. Yeah, or lose 30 pounds forever. But you can like within weeks make a dramatic difference yes. in how somebody feels yes. or moves by understanding these concepts and then knowing how to address it and teach them specifically what they need to do for their body to address the root cause. In fact, You'll change lives in, that way. In fact, one of my most effective sales tools when I would get a new client to show them my value would be to find an area of pain and you can get the CNS to change in one session. Now it's not permanent. You have to train it over time, but you can cause this temporary change within literally one session and they would have pain in their hip. I would find the problem, get the CNS to tighten the muscles that need to be tightened, loosen the muscles that need to be loosened. All of a sudden they're like, my hip pain that I always have is gone. And then they'd hired me because I could show them that particular value. But you're absolutely right. It, over time, over a short period of time, you can make profound differences yes. in how the CNS fires. So you can, through improper training, make yourself tighter and more unstable. But on the other end of that, that coin, through proper training, dramatically improve your functional flexibility, the kind of flexibility that matters, okay? Because flexibility doesn't matter unless you own it. If you don't own it, all you've done is made yourself more prone uh, to injury. So the question then comes, how can I train with weights so I can build muscle, boost my metabolism, look awesome, do all the great stuff, 
but also not get tighter, but rather improve my functional flexibility. What are the things I need to pay attention to when I'm training in order to make this happen? The first most important thing is to train with control. Because when you train loose or you train out of control, the CNS still believes it needs to tighten things up mm -hmm. to keep things stable. Now, as you become more advanced and you've got great control and stability, now you can do explosive, more loose type training and you're okay. But if you're new, especially if you're new, slow and controlled is the way to go because through that full range, through that range of motion that you train in through control, you're adding strength every step of the way. And it's little things too, like even if you're doing a bench press and not realizing that anchoring your legs and your feet into the ground makes a dramatic difference in terms of how the body feels stability wise. So now I'm stable. My hips aren't rotating. I'm not uh, allowing that kind of loose movement at all. And I have a lot more control, which allows my body to get that signal and that feedback that it's okay. It's okay now to ramp up that force production so I can actually start loading a significant amount more. That 60% goes up to 80% real fast. Don't right. be a, uh, what I call a momentum lifter. Yes. You know, I don't know. What would you guys, what would you say the percentage when you, uh, like, if we're talking about a general gym, not a, like a powerlifting gym, not like an advanced, but like your 24 hour fitness, yeah. lifetime fitness. Like, what would you say the percentage of people are like momentum lifters? You know, it's a big percentage. Ooh, it's got to be high. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think they realize it. I think what they do is no. they have sticking points. And so, like, at the bottom of a lateral raise, you see the swing and then control at the top or yeah. a curl, hip thrust, and then, you know, a little bit of a curl at the top, right? Uh, a squat, either a bounce at the bottom or, speed at one point, slow down at another, right? No, they're, they're lacking control. And so they're, they're gaining strength in uneven ways. Yeah. And also to that point, like, um, it doesn't need to be heavy loaded initially. No. Like you can do a lot in terms of your focus yeah. and, uh, creating more muscular tension, even by gripping the bar a little bit more intensively, even as you're allowing the bar to come down slower, I have a nice firm grip and you start training your body in that direction to really hyper control uh, the movement. And then once you start adding weight and, and going through that progressive overload, you really notice the difference of what that did. Totally. I'll tell you what, I'm, I may have put the most muscle on my body I ever did by lifting heavy because I never trained really heavy for most of my career, but I never felt as good as I felt training like this. Training with like four four to six second negatives yes, and yes, pausing totally. at the bottom of it and and just really trying to it, it always push my capacity, my range of motion, always try and and control every part of the movement. And and a lot of times that that required me to dramatically reduce the weight. That's why I used to like not care about PRs because it would be discouraging. If I if I was comparing my bench press or my squat to somebody else's when I was really focusing on the movement and range of motion and control, I'm always going to lose. Yeah. I mean that that person's going to beat me all day long and so I would just take myself out of those conversations with people be like, "Oh, well, how much do you do here?" I don't know. Yeah. I don't even know what I what I PR are I haven't tried that in years because this is how I move when I train. Actually, the goal is even different. The goal when you're training with with incredible control is to use the least amount of weight to achieve the tension and That's the right. rep range that you're looking for. In other words, if I can do, let's imagine we use an intensity scale, one to 10, one being low intensity, 10 being like maximal intensity. If I could make 135 pounds, a 10 on the scale of intensity within 10 reps, or I can make 185 with that 10, the 135 is better because that means I'm doing more control. I'm, I'm making that weight feel heavier through my control. And what happens, you gain even strength. Like you know, today, in fact, I was working out and I was jumping in. There was the, the pec deck, but when you go backwards on it, so you could work your rear delts. And the guy in front of me, very common, controlled up until here. Once he gets here, uh, he's got to swing it to yep. get it to go back more. Well, what part of that range of motion is he losing, right? That back part of the range of motion. Yeah. What ends up happening is he's going to get tighter yep. because he's strengthening here to here with control. Back here, it's a lot of momentum. So as CNS says, well, we don't own that. Like we own that first part. You're going to get tighter, right? Versus the control all the way through. Now this takes us to the next part, which is to train in your fullest range of motion. Now, I emphasize the word your because this is an individual thing. And what this means is, and when I say your fullest range of motion, what I really mean is the range of motion you control and own, yeah. not how far you could push your body, okay? So if you're doing a squat 
and you can go down to parallel with perfect form, but then you go down below parallel and your form is no longer perfect, your fullest range of motion at that moment is parallel. Now, the goal should be to earn the rest of the to way. To figure out how yeah. to get yourself to go lower with that perfect range of motion. But what you don't want to do is train in a larger range of motion that you don't have good form or control over because you're only yeah. making things worse. You know yourself best. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and this is something I was trying to stress so much, especially doing a wall circle for your shoulder, right? This is one of those really difficult ones when you have limitations and you're going to feel that immediately. Uh, and it is, I get questions all the time. Is it better to pull off and, and go through the full uh, circle or is it better to really find that sticking point, hyper-focus on that and start really just trying to gain access to that sticking point? So it, stop in that spot where, you know, your limitation lies, really focus in, squeeze, you know, get more muscular tension, recruit more um, st to stabilize and, and gain access. And, and from there, we can make incremental progress. So it's, it, it may seem like you're not doing a whole lot, but each little sliver, each little centimeter of, mm -hmm. of an angle, that's progress. So you have to look at it completely differently. Now, what would you guys do? Let's use the example you just used, because I think this is an area that everybody is, not everybody, a lot of people are trying to improve, right? That their squat depth. Yeah. So if I, if you were coaching a client who we, we've agreed, we want to work on their range of motion, uh, we, we, 135 is relatively light for them. And we noticed that after, after they break parallel, there, there's breakdown in there. Would you guys break that setup where like you take them to there, they find that, and then you would go do some priming in between and then go revisit it? Or would you do that as a separate session or before? What would that look like? So if you're training that client who their goal is to get an astagrass squat, mm -hmm. we're far from it right now. We recognize that at 135, if we go any, any more below parallel, they break down a little mm -hmm. bit. Where's the coaching at? Where yeah. So uh, first thing I would do, and this is a simple, this doesn't work, mm -hmm. uh, This maybe 50% of the time this would work, is I'd go way lighter mm -hmm. and say, can we go lower than parallel without breaking down just by going down to, let's say, 100 pounds? If the answer is no, now I'm going to do more correctional exercise. And I'll prime and then do a set. Prime and then do a set. And usually what will happen with that is I'll get another inch or two range of motion with good form and good technique. If I don't, I repeat that the next workout and you start to see these incremental Im improvements in range of motion. Now, here's the deal. When you do this, this means you're getting stronger. In other words, because you're training in a greater range of motion than you didn't own before, you're actually lifting more weight technically. So that means if I have a client who did 135 at parallel and three weeks later, we're doing 135 at three inches below parallel, same amount of reps, they're stronger. Oh. I, I, I don't have to add weight. I've just added three inches of range of motion. Well, again, like it's a different exercise at that point of focus. So to your point of bringing the weight down for sure, uh, and then really like changing the tempo. So we're going very slow, focusing on the negative, but then holding. So we're doing like a pause squat. We're generating more force yeah. in the bottom position. Um, and it, it may just be like, honestly, like a centimeter difference of, of gain of access, but that's where we start to build. And then each time, you know, we can see if we can increase a little bit by depth, uh, and squeeze and hold. So more of a pause squat, less loaded, uh, and then just really like take your time going. Oh, down. I would make the case that you could even go unloaded, right? So what I what yeah. I would do this is an area one where I would use a tool that later I found, which was through you, which is like the Dumphy squat, yes. right? So this is an area where I'd use that. Or what I would do is like I would go find a a bench or a box that is lower than what they they. Yeah. Bring. I would do no weight. I'd have them sit on there, and then I'd have like my hands. I'd push on their shoulders and make them drive out of that. So I want them. To, I'm, I want them to feel me forcing against them. I want them to be are starting oh, from I a, love pushing like an immovable yes, object. Right. Yeah. So they're starting from a little bit deeper than where they can technically go on their own loaded, mm -hmm. unloaded, but with me resisting them or an immovable object that like you're saying, which would be like the dumpy squat pushing against that and get them to connect really hard with nothing yep. in that position and then go back to another set light again because I know I'm going to challenge the range of motion so I'm going to strip a little bit of weight off now let's see if we can get down to that box that I just now started you in that was a couple inches lower than what you could before and that now remember this too like I'm not going to take somebody who can only get to 90 all the way to astrograss in one session no. but what I might be able to do in that one session is gain you know two or three more inches of depth in that squat and get them more comfortable in that extra two to three inches yep. and build upon that as we continue and, to go through the program and because you're using weight and because you're using strength training, what you've done is you didn't just give them two inches of 
range of motion. You've given them strength adaptations in an additional two inches uh, range of motion. So this is why other modalities that do improve range of motion don't compare to strength training because they don't add the strength nearly as effectively as strength training does because now you've trained someone, I've gained two inches of range of motion. Yeah. Means nothing if we don't have strength we have in to it. to get out. Yes. Have to get back up. We have to own it. But strength. Because the CNS realizes that there's load there, the CNS connects more, the muscle builds, it gets stronger. Now we've ain't, we've owned, we own now the extra two inches range of motion. Well, this is part of what really excites me uh, about the isometric book that you just re recently wrote that I know we're going to release soon. D Doug, don't get mad at me for talking about it before we have it. He's already but, mad. <laughs> <laughs> but this is one of the things that I'm really excited about because I think there's lots of opportunities for people to utilize a tool like that that has a tremendous benefit. And here's a great example of how you safely gain strength in a new range of motion that you're trying to train for a client yeah. where you do an isometric contraction in a deeper squat than what they can do loaded mm -hmm. to help build that strength in there so later on well, we can load all, them. All, all maps Maximize the recruitment process. Yeah, and yeah. all it's all MAPS Prime or Prime Pro. Like you, you go through the mobility movements in there, that's what you're doing. You're doing isometric contractions through these mobility movements to connect to uh, new ranges of motion. All right, so the next one, this is another reason why sometimes you see people who lift weights are very tight, and that is that they don't train or strengthen their body in all different ranges, excuse me, all different planes. Most of the exercises they do are what are called uh, exercises in the, in the sagittal plane, right? Squatting, pressing, rowing, overhead pressing. Very little lateral strengthening, very little rotational strengthening. So what happens is you become really strong in this one direction. That means the CNS is going to keep you in that one direction because that's the direction that it feels strongest and safest, meaning it's going to limit lateral and rotational movement. So now you go to twist, you're stiff. You go to move sideways, ooh, I don't feel very stable or I injure myself, right? So a good strength training routine strengthens the body in all the planes of motion that exist, right? Above your head, in front of you, behind you, rotationally, laterally, and then combining them all move, and putting them all together. That produces this fluid moving, strong body, which uh, again, that's, uh, that's, as a, that's great. As a young trainer, I really didn't grasp this fully. I remember um, it always happened to me too. Like when I'd be training a client and I'd get a client and they they end up calling me or telling me that they can't come to their session because they hurt themselves. Yeah. They hurt themselves in the garden. They hurt themselves in the shower. But the thing that was like always mind blowing. Yeah, but for you're me, so like, fit. I'm like, we would be squatting and deadlifting and doing these. Yeah. They were so strong. And they're like, what? You were picking your shampoo bottle up in the shower or you pulled a weed yep. out of the dirt. And that like, it was always something that where you picked up a, a, a dog food bag that weighs 30 pounds. I have you, I have you squatting 200 pounds. I don't understand, but I didn't get the importance of that as a trainer to incorporate that. A lot of that came later on. I remember when I hired Justin, I know there was something that he was very passionate about. And a lot of that knowledge and information came from working with him for years and going like, oh, I really neglect this. And I was so young and dumb and I was playing sports and I was doing a lot of it. So I wasn't seeing how that is as a trainer. You don't, if you don't notice it yourself and you don't realize how important it is until I started to get older, until I started to neglect it and I started to see it in my clients. But that was a common theme. I'd yeah. see injury happen. And it always yeah. frustrate me as a trainer because I thought I got them so strong. But what I was, what I was neglecting was getting them strength in the different planes. Yeah. It's very similar to the conversation we're having about depth in your squat uh it's just unfamiliar territory your yes. body just doesn't have that natural response that um you know bracing stability that added support um that should be automatic because you're familiar with that pattern of movement and that range of motion it's the same thing in multiple planes if i'm rotating i have to familiarize my body with those patterns of movement and organize my muscles in a way where they respond properly so i'm stable and strong and i can move my way out of those positions as well um, so it has to be a consideration, even for your average person, because you do get really strong in the gym, you get progress. Uh, but then, you know, a, an instance comes up where you have to rotate and grab something behind you. Uh, and you're going to do it ferociously because you have strength, right? But all of a sudden now, uh, you know, your body doesn't respond like it should. And then a problem happens. Dude, I remember in my twenties, I, I went to the park for a barbecue with the family and I threw the Frisbee yeah. around for 45 <laughs> minutes. And it wasn't like we were crushing it. Like, I just throwing the Frisbee, and my shoulder was jacked. Yeah. It was messed shoulder, up. Shoulder, low back. For a week afterwards. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I work out all the time. Like, well, well obviously, I don't 
I don't train in any of those ranges of motion. I have no strength and stability there. In fact, it's it, you can make this argument that there is a certain ratio of strength and balance that's in the body that, you know, quadricep to hamstring to glute to, to lower lat to, to upper back to chest to shoulder to bicep to tricep. And there's lots of ratios of, of, of strength that are balanced. Well, if you're always training in one particular way, you throw those ratios off. So then what happens? You increase your risk of injury because... You know, if, if there's a certain ratio of strength that is required for me to throw a really fast uh, fastball, for example, there's the muscles generating the force, but there's the ones that are stabilizing, preventing my arm from th coming off my body or my humerus from twisting too much, and the, the muscles that have to slow it down. Well, if there's an imbalance in that ratio, if it's too strong in one direction, not in the other, I'm going to cause problems. Mm -hmm. There's also this, like if I'm, and this is to your point, Justin, if I always train in this one plane of motion, and then I move outside of that range, and I move into a different plane of motion, my body may just call upon the recruitment pattern that it's used to in the other in the wrong range of motion. Right. So instead of stabilizing laterally, it tries to stabilize like if I were moving forward, boom, I hurt my knee, or I twist my ankle, I roll my ankle. What the hell is going on? This is so weird. Well, we talked about this the other day. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't you make the case for the argument that you are at higher risk even being somebody who's strength trains and then you move out of that range of motion because you have so much power. You're producing a lot more force. Yeah, it's like somebody who has like an old classic car like mine and you decide to throw a supercharger on it, but I haven't reinforced the rear end or the suspension. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I can beef up that motor. That I'm more likely to get in an accident or break something on my car by mm -hmm. adding that extra horsepower than if I was just to leave the engine alone and be like, oh, Dude, I'll just cruise around. I had a around. buddy that did that. Yeah, he put, all of, he yeah. put a ton of money and in, in, uh, time into the power in the car, didn't reinforce, didn't strengthen the frame, twisted the frame yeah, yeah. of the car because it couldn't support the power. And your body's the same way. You yes. get really, really strong in the gym. You neglect to do that rotational stuff and, and, and make sure you protect it like that. And you become at higher risk yeah. of injury Look than at, the person who's doing nothing. That's right. Look at your workout. Does your workout, is all the exercises in front of you above your head? Are you doing any rotation? Are you doing any lateral stability? This is one of the reasons why we encourage people to do all of our MAPS programs. It's not because you can't follow MAPS anabolic in you know, if forever or we maps want aesthetic, all your money. Or, yeah, or be <laughs> it's because each program is has its strengths, but it also has its weaknesses, and the other programs fill in those gaps, right? So, training in all the different planes is extremely important to give you that functional flexibility um, and to prevent you from getting tight. All right, this next one is also very important, which is to do correctional and mobility work often, because inevitably, regardless of all the planes of motion you train, all the full range of motion. Because you're strengthening, because you're training, because you're working with weight, there are going to be issues that'll start to pop up over time. And it's almost impossible to prevent every single issue. Correctional work and mobility work fills in those gaps. It really does. Like there are mobility movements and correctional exercises that are so different from traditional strength training exercises that I don't think I would reach those ranges of motion with traditional strength training exercises. For example, handcuffs with rotation. There's no resistance training exercise that gets my shoulder through that incredible range of motion. So really the only way to strengthen all that and articulate all that is through correctional work. Do you guys think you guys have found what that ratio is for yourself or for clients? Like what what ratio of mobility work to strength traditional strength training work do you need to have to keep a pretty stable body? Like do you guys have an idea to keep a stable body? Yeah, like or to, to, or to, to, to correct. To so, well, both, right? Okay, so yeah. like I mean, it's like what does that look like? Like I, I have an idea for myself, but to be honest, like I, I haven't consistently done this with clients enough to see where I could go, oh, I think a two to one ratio. As yeah. long as you're doing, you know, one day of, of mobility correctional type work to your two days of strength training, you should be able to protect yourself, increase range of motion, yeah. fix any sort of issues. The way I used to do it with my clients, which is not the best way to do it, was when an issue would pop up, then we would spend more time correcting that issue and then it got better and then we'd go back to uh, strength training. Towards the end of my career, I figured out that if I did, if they were going to do an hour workout with me, 15 minutes of it, if I could do 15 minutes of it to be correctional work and mobility work, that seemed to be a pretty good ratio for them. Yeah, it, it, that's a tough question because it, again, like if we're talking correctional, we may need to up that frequency yeah. uh, quite a bit to address and, and to get them back patterning the right type of uh, response. But um, you know, something I've, I, and, and again, this kind of speaks back to us, like not t 
favoring cardio quite as much, but I tend to favor mobility way more than cardio. And so oh, I'll, totally. I'll program that in where a lot of people would probably uh, program in cardio. It's almost on a very similar ratio uh, of that in terms of like weight training and then in, in pairing that with, with mobility just as a, as a constant um, uh, addressing uh, joints, function, stability. So that way we're continuously uh, making sure that we're, we're keeping tabs of like how, how well our, our joints are, are stabilizing so we can progress. So it's not like we're going to hit these plateaus. I love that you went that way, Justin, because this is what I, this is what I experienced. And this is my own, this is my own personal mobility journey, right? Because in the last, you know, decade uh, or even less than that last five years, I'd say um, I put more work into that than I ever have in my training career. Um, and I have the the best mobility and stability, I think that I've ever had in my, in my career today than I have in all my prior years of training. And what it took to get here was a tremendous amount of work and effort in the mobility and, you know, trying to increase flexibility and strength and range of motion. Like it took a ton of effort and work. It took me actually thinking about it multiple times a day, even if it means just getting down and doing a combat stretch for a minute or two, doing it as frequent as possible. And I would say the ratio of that to strength was more like a four to mobility, one to strength mm -hmm. to get to where I need. Now, here's the cool part, though. I rarely do it anymore. Yeah, maintaining yeah. is a totally once different. Once you model. got there, you put that work in. Because once you get there, if you know what traditional strength training exercises to do to keep yes. you like that, yeah. you, and I shouldn't say traditional because there's things that are unconventional, like the mace. By the way, you do handcuff rotation right. for you know a year of your life every single day example. like crazy, and then you go swing a mace club just you know every time you do shoulders, and you'll be good. Yeah. Or you know work on your ankle mobility. Yeah, work on your ankle mobility, your hip mobility to get down to a 90-90 squat. Then actually make sure you always incorporate yeah. really deep squats where you pause at the bottom and you connect. And you'll I, I don't do that stuff hardly at all anymore unless I've been neglecting training in general for a couple of weeks at a time, which is rare for that to happen for me. That's what's kind of cool about this is at the beginning – yeah, it might take a lot of work. Yeah, it may, may it seem laborious to be doing these mobility drills and things like that. But if you if you put the work in, you get to a place where the shoulders are feeling good again, the hips are feeling good. Then there are strength training exercises that you can do to keep you mobile forever. And then and then you rarely have to do yeah. any of that stuff, which yeah, is that's amazing. True. I remember years ago, um, I wanted to be able to do behind the neck pull ups so bad. Uh, probably because Rocky did them <laughs> in Rocky four. hundred percent. Seems and, logical. <laughs> yeah. And you know, th th I mean, if, if you never did put behind the next pull-ups and you always did pull-ups to the front, like that's like, you feel like you're going to tear your shoulders off. Like it's not good. So I went through this process of shoulder mobility work and it did, it took me like six months and then I was able to do behind the neck pull downs. And I did that for a little while. And then I got to the point where I could do behind the neck pull-ups. Now I could do behind the neck pull-ups and I never have to do anything for shoulder mobility to be able to do that anymore. So yeah. totally. So maintaining is way less volume, way less frequency than getting there in the first place. Yeah. What's your, what is the, uh, Olympic where you just overhead squat? Like is it the, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, one of my favorite things about that movement is I, you have to have incredible thoracic mobility, incredible shoulder mobility, incredible hip mobility, incredible ankle mobility. Yep. Yes. So and I, core stability. I, it's, yeah. It's and core the stability. pinnacle of, of knowing whether or not you have the, the, uh, mobility and the stability to pull it off. It's so great. That's my favorite part about that movement is to just, you know, intermittently incorporated into my routine real like to, I ain't trying to get really strong at it or be the best. Like I load it a little bit so I can work it, but it's really just to keep everything mobile through one single yeah. strength training exercise. So if you can work to get to where you can do that moment, a movement, and then you can learn to discipline yourself to keep that movement in your routine throughout the rest of your life, you're going to have healthy shoulders, going to have healthy hips, going to have healthy ankles for a very long time. Very mm -hmm. true. All right, so this next one, this one, uh, if you do everything right, but you mess this up, you're going to be tight, and that is overtraining. When you overtrain, your body is in this constant state of healing, lots of inflammation, and your CNS is limiting range of motion on purpose. So if you've ever overworked in a workout, you know exactly what this feels like. Over time, this feels like more joint pain, more stiffness, lack of mobility. In fact, for me, over this is my... Number one, most, uh, this is the one sign that tells me I'm overdoing it. Like mm -hmm. if I start to feel stiff, if I start to lose range of motion mm -hmm. and it's just like that all the time and I get up and I feel stiff and why does my hip hurt and what's going on with my shoulder, 
that's when I go, I'm overtraining. I'm just doing too much. So even if you do everything right, if you train too hard or too often or both, um, this is going to limit your range of motion and cause some, some, some serious flexibility issues. And again, like I said, this is my number one sign. I know I'm overtraining when I am stiff all the time. For it's sure. very hard to stay under control when you're in a state of fatigue or you're, you've overdone it. Or yes. you, yeah. So, I mean, this is definitely a, a, an indication. Um, a lot of times too, if I'm not bracing properly and I'm going, just kind of going through the momentum of the, the exercise and you start to notice, um, you know, you're really resting too much on your joints and, you know, your muscles aren't contributing quite as much. Um, you know, that for me is a sign I need to kind of, you know, back off a little bit of the intensity, the volume. Now, what about nutritionally? Like, what do you, do you think there's, there's rules, uh, to this, or do you think that that plays a big, a big role in this? Like, do you have any, any tips like nutritionally with this? Uh, hydration has got to be the, the number one. Like if uh -huh. you, if you are not drinking enough water, you will feel tight. Yeah. You will feel tight. You will feel joint pain. I, I remember when my, I had a client that this blew my mind. I, I was a relatively new trainer. Couldn't figure out why we, we got some of the back pain to go away, but couldn't really figure out why it was still kind of lingering or whatever. And I had this other trainer talk about just drink. They need to drink more water. They're not hydrated. Mm -hmm. And I thought that sounds stupid, but they kept telling me. And I said, I'm going to try this. Told this client, let's aim for this much water every single day. They did. And they're like, oh my God, it's how my back pain is gone. And I was like, holy cow. I didn't realize that had that big of an impact. I, I would add like inflammatory foods too. Like if sure. you're eating foods that you're intolerant to, or you have a major inflammatory response to it. Um, I mean, it's really hard to move a joint through its full range of motion. If there's like serious inflammation this, in the body. This is most, this is especially true for the core. So when you eat like what are the one of the, the hallmarks of eating something that you don't digest very well, right? Yeah, bloat. bloat, yeah. You feel bloated. And what happens when you're bloated is your gut ex distends a little bit and it stretches the core muscles out just enough so that they lose optimal control and stability. So think of it yeah. this way. If I take your your if I take your quad and I stretch your quadricep really hard, or I even stretch a little bit and then try to get you to generate as much force, you're not gonna be as strong because it's in this weird kind of stretched position. Well that's what happens to the core when it gets distended. This is why pregnant women start to lose core stability, right? The baby's pushing things out. So now you're slightly distended. Muscles now have to fire differently just to stabilize. And you actually get more back pain. Uh, yeah. Back pain can oftentimes be related to just poor core stability from bloat, yeah. from digestive issues, which yeah. sounds crazy, but it's you know it's, it's totally well, true. You notice that with the back arching and everything else sort of compensating as a result of that. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah, totally. What, you know, what, one of my favorite to highlight that and why why I asked that and brought it up is because one of my favorite like periods of like working on mobility was when I was also incorporating fasting. I always noticed like I had these great mobility days. It took me a while <laughs> to kind of register that like why we're the connection was yeah. the correlation i thought oh that's crazy i wonder if plus you're focused on hydrating too. yeah exactly i'm staying busy so that's, that's a good point so it kind of proves both points there right i was probably drinking a bunch of water more than i probably was before because you're hungry and then i'm not <laughs> yeah. yeah and then i'm and i'm not eating anything so i definitely have got all inflammation tamped down and those were some of my best mobility yeah. sessions to do that so it's a that's a, a great thing i think for people to think about if you are having a hard time working on this flexibility is to also potentially look into yep. uh, your offenders nutritionally too. Yep, totally. So, you know, there you have it, right? If, if functional flexibility is range of motion plus strength, you can't find anything better than strength training for that. And those are the reasons uh, why. And we just told you how to do it. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. You can find Adam on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. 